sending that email to Apple that day was the right time to do it. In, you're in your 20s again by magic and you've just graduated. Would you take the same step? I have five tests left. I'm 41 years old. We're here today with Angelo D'Alessandro. It's Andrea and Simone again. Uh, thank you for this chat. We wanted to start with just a brief recap of your past experiences. So you worked for seven years for Unicredit, one of the biggest banks in Italy as, and the last three of which has had of innovation. And in 2015, you founded Buddy Bank, an innovative banking system for iPhones that with the peculiarity of having a 24-7 concierge system and that was powered by people, not by intelligent uh, AI. Now you're working with live person in New York. I, I remember that the first time that I met you, you had this beautiful speech in my previous university. And I remember you were talking about Buddy Bank and your first experience with it. If I'm not wrong, you sent an email to Apple and they accept the idea and you went to Copertino. I found that, that speech incredible and I would be so happy if you can talk a little bit about it. Sure, thanks for having me guys first. Very excited and when I can help, just I'm very, very happy about that. So, correct. Thank you. Actually, I, actually, I spent the last 20 years in, uh, in Unicredit. In the last uh, five years, so in 2015, we had the opportunity to design this disruptive, innovative, crazy, beautiful concept that is Body Bank. As you said, we, we wanted to do something unique. So we wanted to create the best experience for iPhone customers. And to do that, we involved Apple in a very original way. And Apple basically said, hmm, this is, this is cool, so let, let's talk. And with them, we, we started to work on the design of the project. Of course, the relation with Apple, you know, that company is, is my favorite company all over the world, but is a kind of very particular company with very strictly rules. Uh, so working with them is not easy at all. Basically, you follow their rules and you follow their kind of agreements, so commercial agreement for Apple Pay and all this kind of stuff. I'm talking about the B2B relation, not the consumer relation. With BodyBank, we went for something bigger than that. So we wanted to sign with them an, an alliance agreement based on a strategy. And when I, when I left, basically we were at the beginning of this, of this beautiful journey. It was, it was a dream that we realized and uh, we were very lucky and proud to work with a company like this and with Unicredit as well. So yes, correct. You, you remember correctly that situation. It is one of those kind of situation that you say one email can change your life. Exactly. Uh, that, that, uh, yeah, in, in any sense. So <laughs> one email can change your life in, in any sense. So I think that sending that email to Apple that day was, was the right time to do it. You know, uh, it's very important to, to be patient and wait for the right timing. When you feel that you are doing something good. I, I made tons of mistakes. I sent tons of wrong emails. But then that email uh, for Apple was the right one and at the right moment. So mm -hmm. we've been lucky. And I've been personally very, very lucky. We need a kind of starter to do stuff. So basically, I consider myself a, a starter, someone that started something, like an idea. But just by myself, I really couldn't reach anything. Another piece of crucial part in this journey was the commitment of such a big organization like Unicredit. We had the great opportunity to work in a moment where Unicredit was leading by a visionary management. The CEO was Federico Gizzoni, Paolo Fiorentino, the chief operating officer and my boss. Paolo is one of the most visionary, brave and strong leader I have met in my life. And also Paolo, Paolo was a starter for me. I was a starter for the project. Anything you want to do and you have a great idea, then if you don't enrich that piece of idea with other people, idea, you're not going anywhere. So with BodyBank, this, this is what happened. I, it's true, I, I conceived and designed the concept of being the first conversational bank, 24 seven available, 24, with a lifestyle concierge. But immediately after, right after I had the first okay from the Unicredit top management, I started to put together a great team of people, a great team of talent. And most of them are still there working and fighting for Body Bank. So without them, basically, Body Bank wouldn't exist now. It was something unbelievable. But again, uh, you need great people to create great products. Because most of the time, we consider ourselves maybe what we are not. Every time you think that you're doing something cool, 
it's not cool enough and you need other people's mind on it. And then it's going to be cool enough. I remember when we started to work with BodyBank, the idea was not the idea that at the end we launched on the market. It was with similar, let me say, touch points, but definitely something very, very different. We, we've been able to do that because we enriched my idea with other, other brilliant ideas of other people that joined me in this beautiful journey. So it's basically you can't do everything by yourself. It's a really good point. I mean, of course, no one alone can create really good things, which brings us to one of our first questions. So basically, you were working in, uh, in, in Body Bank building a concierge service which made the human contact as its main distinctiveness, its main advantage. Now you are more focused on in artificial intelligence, right? And I'm really curious to know your opinion about uh, the relationship between bots, automatic services and uh, humans in nowadays society. So what do you think is the role that artificial intelligence have and in which cases does human's contact become irreplaceable? Human contact is always irreplaceable. There is no way to replace our, our brain. And there is no way that a machine can do that. 100% I deeply believe that we need humans. Technology is just something that can enable you to scale, maybe through automation. But definitely, I'm still betting all my vision on human and how we can help other people, the sense of community that we want to put together. I have the great opportunity now to work on this new project and one of my advisor is Peter Block. Peter Block is one of the greatest men I ever met and he's a, he wrote up an amazing book called Community. And if you read that book, you will see that we will need human forever. We need to be there. We need to create this sense of belonging. And also in business services, in banks, and every kind of services, you need this human touch 100% of the time. Of course, how you can serve 1 million customers with, uh, just with humans, this, that's not possible. Actually, you need, maybe you need like a customer support team of 50,000 people and you can't afford that because your p and is gonna is going to crash. So to do that, we definitely need to think about how automation can help humans to, to execute their service in a better way, serving most, more customers than the one they can serve if there is only human to human. Uh, regarding AI, I personally believe that we are still in a phase where AI needs to prove that it's something very, very mature and, and let me call it cool. I think the vision for AI, AI is great. I'm working for one of the most advanced company in the world regarding on this topic. But, but it's still, I see that we need room for improvement there. There are no machines, again, that can replicate our human brain. My company is one of the worldwide lead, leader in this. And uh, it's great to see how customers are leading their, their massive amount of conversation through automation. And that's, that's cool. But th there is always the human touch behind. You can't say I will be 100% human based or 100% automated. You need to find a good balance among these two worlds that they are talking to each other in a very strategic way. And there are now, finally, there are like a lot of ways to, to do it. And uh, so it's, it's very exciting. So you basically would say, like, let's say you're summing it up, that technology is a a great tool, but it's still a tool and it must remain, it will always remain a tool. I'm a, I'm a big fan of human beings. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to be like this. At least I don't want to see technology taking over. I want to see human beings using technology in another way, in a, be in a better way. Yeah, no, absolutely. That would be terrible. No, uh, I, I find this speech so interesting also because we have another, another guest who is I don't know if you know him. He built a company called and he went to the the last year over there in New York and they can find a really clear touch point between you and him. Really and also like with the line because that, that we also really focused well, on human yes. interactions, of course, and creation and of value of through sense right. of community, of course, which also is going to bring us to, um, I love the fact that this conversation is kind of naturally flowing to the questions. And so we were talking about the human contact and its relationship with customers as well. So with BuddyBank, 
you manage to create a really good relationship between young people and their bank. With Buddy Bank, you manage to completely change this relationship up to the point that you made your customer your main brand ambassador. So we just wanted to know what is the key ingredient to fidelize customers this much? We achieved that with a very simple recipe. And there is a very good news here. People and human beings, all of us, we are animal. So we feel things. Nobody can cheat us. Nobody. We feel things. And we feel when a brand is real or when a brand just have marketing statement and at the end they are just like the other one. With Body Bank, big difference there is that they are real. We were real and they are still real. They are real. They care about the customer and they are there 24-7 to help the customer in any way. Even if sometimes helping customer means following your guts and not processes. This is a very important topic, especially in the banking industry. One of the main issues in the banking industry all over the world that processes are more important than humans. U.S. Bank in the U.S. recently Christmas time, they fired a customer support operator because she made a, an emotional decision. She followed her gut to help a customer that they was in trouble. He needed to, he, this guy needed to take a bus and go back to his family. It was Christmas night. It was a, the process, I don't know, didn't work very well. So this guy needed $20 to go home. Following the process, the, the bank couldn't give this guy $20. So the operator just told him like, okay, meet me here at this gas station. I will give you $20 for my wallet. And they fired her. They fired her. And if you look at the, the, the tagline of this bank, I think they say something like customer centricity kind of thing. But this is, it's not for them. I, won't, I would love to, to help US Bank to do things in a different way because it's not them. It's the banking industry that is, needs to change. Right? There is a big difference of treating customer as account number or, or family members or best friends. And this is what we were, exactly. doing, we were doing there. And they are still doing it because I'm a customer, a very happy customer. So there is no a secret recipe to create ambassadors instead of customer. You have to be human. You have to be loyal. And you have to solve their problems in any way you can, even if this is going to cost us some, or cost you some money. It's the first time that I hear that from, from this kind of perspective. Moving on, I would say to move to your background specifically about your focus on Italy, okay? You mentioned USA, you moved to New York in the last year, but basically all your experience is based on Italy. So as you know, many people see their country as a limit to their ambition. What do you think about this kind of limits and what do you think is the role of digital in this scenario? I think at first, uh, I'm in love with my country and I think that Italy has so much potential that to express that is, is the best place to be and to live and to make the difference. So we need to help our country. We need talents to be there, to work there, to create innovation there. That's most of the time when you, when you talk with someone and they, they complain about where they are, it's just an excuse. It's not true. It's just a pure excuse. So zero excuses. You can make the difference in Italy, in Russia, in the US, in Japan. It's up to you. No excuse. There is no government. If I look back and I look at myself and my team there, we created a bank from scratch. We, we created something that was, was not expected, was something unique, but we did it in Italy. So bullshit is, is not digitalized. Italy is a, an amazing country with great people. If you complain about the country, it's just an excuse that you turn something that you, is missing in you against something else. The politics and the country and the rules, it's not like this. Creating something from scratch is going to be tough in Italy, it's going to be tough here, it's going to be tough in, in Japan. Make the difference is tough. Going with the flow is pretty easy. It, it's up to you, like which kind of the risk appetite you have. But never, never complain about you are not lucky enough or you were born in, a, in, the, right, in the wrong place. There are no wrong places in the world. Yeah, I find this really interesting point. And yeah, which also like relates to the personal ambition so most of the time as you said people just make an excuse excuses or it's too, there's too much bureaucracy i can't do this i can't do that i, I agree with you when i when you say that it's it really depends on the person how hungry you are in a sense how much ambitious you are how ambitious you, you are have, you need to be comfortable with the 
exactly. concept of risk, definitely. Which brings us also to our next point, which is kind of on the opposite side of, us, of the spectrum. So we're talking about ambition, being hungry, uh, taking risks. On the other side is kind of being content and settling down. Where do you think one should start and the other should begin? I mean, in, is there any time you should say, probably I'm not, I shouldn't do this, I should probably wait a bit, for example, as you did with Body Bank. And also what made you decide to risk it on Body Bank and then even moving on to another continent completely? Yeah, this is, this is very, I mean, uh, personal. Uh, it's up to us. It, you have to feel it. You have to, you have to understand which kind of level of risk is good for you and for your life. Because at the end, I was thinking this even before this crazy pandemic, but basically the, we have no room to make long-term plans. If you think where, where I'm going to be in 20 years, you will never know that. Maybe you're going to be poor, rich, successful. You're going to be happy, depressed. You're going to be dead. You're going to be here. You don't know. Having long-term plans now is something that doesn't really matter. But due to the fact of the, the risk appetite or it's up to us you i think we need to live in a in a good way and if you feel good taking risks is something very good to do but if you feel stressed and if you if you, if you prefer something like is more quiet because taking risks is like a is a roller coaster so one day you're up one day you're down one day you risk your job the other day you don't know what's going on the other day you're excited because something that you built is real but definitely is not the only ingredient you need. If you're just a, a, like a person who loves risk and that's it, nothing is going to happen. Risk must be matched with the other stuff. Competencies, so contents, talent, the sponsorship that you need all the time you want to do something. So if you are a risk taker, you are good, you're talented, etc. But at the end, you don't have the person that really believes in you, you're going to stay there where you are. So the sponsorship is very, is fundamental for everything you want to do because you always need someone to help you to accelerate or to enable what you have in mind. So it's not only a matter of taking risks. It's a matter of being able and feel good in taking risks be ready for the uncertainties. This is, this is very crucial. I, I think that the new generation is already very ready for uncertainties and is a very good, good way. I, I'm confident that you guys, you are going to rule this world in, a, in an amazing way, in a great way. You are very, very good in dealing with something that you can't plan in advance. And this is very cool. And I, I'm sorry for the, the old generation that is still there hanging, hanging in there, like saying, oh my God, I want to leave my, I don't want to leave my chair, but they are destroying the world basically because they are not able, their brain is not ready to change it in a very quick way. They want data to analyze what could happen if. There are no fucking data. You can't analyze everything. Look at this. Look at what's happening now. We are... We are here, locked down everywhere. There are no military forces. There are no scientists. We are all locked down. So this is a, definitely a new world and a new normal. And this is for people that can make decisions and take risk in a new way. It's a good news for you guys. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your words. Let's hope the best for the future. <laughs> I mean, let's see, let, let's deal with this problem first, with yeah. the pandemic first, and then we can move on. Yeah. Quick follow-up question. So you, you were talking about the fact that, let's say, the old generation is more tight to their chairs and to their views, whereas young generation, our generation is more dynamic in a sense. Do you think it's something that comes with age as well? I mean, when, when I will become older, I feel like I could become the same as nowadays old generation. Do you think? No, no, not at all. Age is, has no role in this. I told you at the mm -hmm. beginning, Paolo Fiorentino, I think Paolo is more mm -hmm. than 60 years old. He's one of the most innovative person I ever met. Also, my previous boss in, in Uniquity, when I left, was uh, uh, my last, actually, uh, Andrea Casini. I think Andrea is also over 60 and uh, another great man. So age doesn't really matter. It's like kind of mentality. It's like, I think your background, people that he surrounded you for a long time can affect your brain in a good or in a bad way. So maybe something very, really bad happened in, in your career and you, you are now shocked and you don't want to take any more risks because that was something bad for you. So maybe you are like this. I think there's a lot of seeds, bad ones, starting from the school. So still, uh, we are not ready to, to create entrepreneurs in, in schools mm -hmm. because sometimes they 
teach you the like in a very scholastic way how you should run something a business a company but they don't teach you how to deal with risk how to deal with failure how to use your emotional intelligence and your psychology to do something great i had the opportunity to met and to i'm still working with great innovators that are 70 years old 6 years old so i had in my team people like 23 years old with a mindset that you cannot believe it. They, they were looking like, like, I don't know, 90 years old person that they always lived <laughs> in, a, in a small town in the countryside. And we need to help those people to be more flexible. We need to help to enlarge their vision in this new normal, in this new world, when you can't mm-hmm. avoid risks and you have to feel comfortable. And then Again, take never, when I talk about risk, it's not doing crazy stuff. I'm talking about risk that in a certain way, they can give you a, a perspective of two or three scenarios. So if this is going to be good, basically, I'm very happy. And this is going to be bad. What could happen? So what's the worst case? Always there, you have to think about the worst case scenario. Basically, most of the time, where you land is something in the middle. You will never reach the moon. You will never go like totally broken, but you will reach something in the middle. For this reason, guys, it's very, very, very important when you start something to dream big. Dream big. Don't dream like something, oh, this could work. Little by little, we'll see. No, no, dream big. Because after that, after you, you big dream, you will be forced to cut pieces. So you will cut the pieces of this, a pieces of that. Then your investor will say, no, this is too much. Cut it, cut it, cut it. And at the end, you're going to land in some area that is still good, but was not so big. If you do the opposite, so you start in a shy way, probably you're going to fail. So dream big. Look at the sky and say, like, I want to be there because I want to be, I don't know, you, you will have an idol. I want to be that man. I want to be the better version of that man. I want to be me. And I want to I wanna learn from him or her how they reach that su- success. And I want to be better than that. I think this perspective is very positive to, to obtain something that at the end is going to be uh, realistic. Let me call it realistic. Mm-hmm. I really like what you said because this is one of the key values that inspire all my life. I always try to do something that is unbelievably big then people don't trust me and maybe I don't find the right team, but this is another problem. <laughs> but also, guys, I like with the, with the, the, the project that you are now leading, why people should listen to this uh, video podcast? Why? Because you need to find a way in which you can entertain people. Every 30 seconds of people that are still here listening to us is because we need to feed them. We need to give them something that can enrich in a certain way their journey and you guys you have to dream big but you need to find very interesting content the world is could be so boring and we need to do something to make the world a better place starting also from what you're doing yeah one of our key points is is also getting out of the comfort zone which is basically what we were talking about let's find a way also to ask like questions that are not so common or in, or in a comfort zone because maybe maybe you will cut it but you at least you you can extract something that is unexpected this is something crucial because sometimes when you we like things where are unexpected where are not like something that we can have everywhere basically so i think this is a very crucial point to make this beautiful operation that you're leading very very entertaining thank you very much thank you we are going to do our best <laughs> Yeah, the last point is about your uh, degree, right? Mm. So That's I've seen on your LinkedIn profile that you have taken a degree in your last three years. Okay, marketing actually, and communication. I, actually, I'm still studying. Oh, yes? Oh. oh. So that's a, why? That's a, that's what is a the value good, behind that? That's a, that's a very good question. I'm happy to answer. So, um, yeah, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm, I have five tests left and I, I will get my degree in marketing. I'm 41 years old. Long story short, I started the university to get an economy degree in 1997. At that time, with the the accountant degree in high school, you could work for a bank, basically. Not not now, but back back in the time, yes. Back then. Oh, they, (laughs) they, they hired me and I left the university because I wanted to make money. I was like feeling like that I was not learning things that I was 
excited about in the university at that time. I always dreamed about having my degree. So when I, I had the opportunity to become a, an, an executive in Unicredit and uh, I had the opportunity to, to launch Body Bank. And when they started to in, inviting me in the universities, like the, the speech that you attended a couple of years ago, and at the end of this, those kind of speeches, a lot of guys that were students used to come and ask me, so what's your background? So what's your degree? And, and I, I was very like kind of embarrassed, say, embarrassed saying like, oh, guys, actually, I, I don't have a degree. I have to, I'm, I'm studying now. So I see two things here. First, you definitely need to study and you need to get your degree uh, because now it's very hard doing this at 41 years old running a new project in a new country, taking care of my family, it's very stressful. So you need to study, you need to get going with your, your, your degree, you need to learn, you need to be curious, you need to challenge also your professor sometimes. You need to look for courses and, and disciplines that can help you in the real world. I would invite you to keep going and fighting for your uh, education. Another aspect, which is a kind of tricky, now, to me, the university is way, way more interesting than it was before. Because now that I, I put together, not a lot, but some experiences in all these years in working, basically, in the banking industry, I found everything I'm studying for, for my, my degree very connected with my experiences, very connected with multiple projects that we, we worked on. So actually now is way more easy and fun because I don't have to, to, to study about something that is like unrelated with what I did and what I'm doing, but it's very connected. So how we can fill this gap, basically? I think that the, the um, solution there is we should transform the university system with something which is more, again, a hybrid solution, matching literature and things that we can learn from the past with the very fast and liquid present where, that we are living now. I had the opportunity to work with people that they were just coming from like most important universities, in, especially in Italy. So very f full of himself, like say, like, you know, I'm a, I could be the CEO here. Actually, they, they were not nothing because no one is nothing, but they were not in the right place to express what they, what they are. After you finish the university, I think you, it's very good to reset your brain saying, okay, what I just started will be very helpful maybe in five, six or 10 years, but now I have to study again. I have to start again. I have to start to see how the real world is, is working. I have to start how I can have an impact in this particular company, which is totally different than another company. It's totally different than mm -hmm. what you studied. And this is what I'm doing here every day. When I joined this company, was a, a life person is an amazing company. Unicredit is an, another amazing company. And I'm blessed to be there, to have the opportunity to work for Unicredit for so many years. But now I'm learning new things every single day. It's like I'm at school. I didn't came say, oh, I did body bank. I, I think that I, I, I know stuff. I don't know. I don't know stuff. I'm learning stuff. And think about me, I'm 41 years old, and I want to learn every single day something new. Being humble. Being also proud of what I did. I'm not saying, oh, I'm not faking with you guys that I'm, I'm very proud of what I did. I'm very proud of body. I'm proud to be here. And you should. But, <laughs> yeah, definitely. But that, that's the key. That I want. So you can't stop learning. So when you finish, you, you get your degree and you, you jump in a, in a real corporation or small company or a startup, try to reset your brain and, and tell to yourself, okay, I'm starting again. Because it's, all the time is just a matter of starting again. Starting again. And I think we have just one last question, yeah. which kind of relates to what you were saying now, for example. Yeah, which is about age. We were talking about this topic and now I'm, I would like to hear your answer. In, you're in your 20s again by magic and you've just graduated. Would you take the same steps or would you change something probably? That's a very good question. You know, now it's easy to answer because I, I, I went through a yeah. lot of things. So I would invite people to be very curious and to be able to listen. I think that uh, being able to listen 
is a great talent and they don't teach you the, at the at school. Being a good listener and being able to be a sponge in a kind of way, especially when you start something, is a very good way to understand what you want to do with your life. And most of the time we don't do this because we have we think that we, we think that we have a clear vision. Uh, but look at my story. I didn't. I left the university. And I joined a bank. Then I wanted I wanted to be a jazz singer, but I'm not Michael Bublé. I'm not Frank Sinatra, and I knew that. So I what I, I did that, and I I used that as an experience to be more comfortable on stage. So now when they invited me in conferences, or I have to do a presentation at work, I'm very I'm, I have the adrenaline, I'm very tense, but that experience on stages, I also used to play at the Blue Note Jazz Club in Milano, so it was something serious, but I always knew that I, I would never have been like a singer because I didn't want to do that. But look at, look at that, I jumped from that to a, a bank, then, then to the innovation department of one of the most important banks in the world, then putting together a new project, meeting new people, putting together a team, so I always and continually change stuff. I give you this little uh, note. After 10 years in Unicredit, I had the opportunity to work for a guy, a guy, a, a very, very important person, but he's a guy because he's very innovative. Now he's retired. His name is Stefano Signani. And was, he was leading the um, ICT strategy for Unicredit. I, when I joined uh, Stefano's team uh, as a project manager, manager uh, of Basically, I was his assistant, but the cool name is Project Man. Basically, <laughs> I joined his team and I was thinking, oh my God, I'm very cool. I will do great stuff here. And I remember that I didn't speak for six months. I just listened. I, I just figured out what these people were saying because I didn't know. <laughs> and I didn't want to say something wrong. So I just waited and waited and waited. And then what happened that Stefano actually appreciated the fact that I was not just saying stuff because I wanted to say something. This is very, very dangerous. So never do that. It's better to listen and to feel yourself sometime like a kind of nonsense or kind of idiot. I'm not, what, what, what's my role here? It's good. What's my role here? Ask this to yourself because it will, it will come the day that you will be ready to say the right thing. And when I did that with Stefano, he saw in me a potential maybe that I, I could have lead something more related with innovation. And this is what he did. He pushed me in that career path and I started from there. So again, guys, it's like uh, you have to be smart. You have to, to understand and you have to be very, very, very humble. Never think that you are better than another person because this is going to drain you is going to kill you basically sometimes they say that there's no stupid questions but most of the times it actually might be wrong <laughs> exactly well i think that was it at yeah. least for our questions yes i mean it's all we plan to say but maybe you have some more no that's... i think there were, there were really good other points that we no, I mean, had I, throughout i was thinking that i'm really in trouble now because you said so many interesting things that i don't know how to edit the video <laughs> what should i should i put first <laughs> just put the whole video it doesn't matter anyway guys i'm, I'm very happy to join you in this uh, beeline uh, exercise i'm very excited about what you're doing i'm here to help you and other people that need help good luck for what you do be brave be bold and you're doing a great stuff thank you very much for having me today well, thank you very much for, you, you. for everything you said and all the kind words that you said really we really appreciated that thank you very much this was andrew d'alessandro thank you very much and good luck <laughs> good luck as well <laughs> see you man thank you yeah.